Welcome to Equus Farm Calls, where we take horse owners along with us to discuss important topics on equine health and care with industry experts. Today, we're talking about equine colic with Dr. Allison Gardner. The Equus Farm Calls podcast is brought to you in 2022 by Farnham. I'm Kim Brown, group publisher of the Equine Health Network. Allison Gardner is a veterinarian as well as a specialist in equine surgery and emergency and critical care. She's an assistant professor in equine surgery in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Science at The Ohio State University. Welcome, Dr. Gardner. Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. Well, we have worked together before, and I just really like the way that you present information. And I think our audience is going to enjoy today what you have to uh, share with us. But I'm going to start with, we know that in most equine industry surveys that colic and lameness are always the top two issues that horse owners are worried about. So why do so many horses have issues with colic? And maybe we start with some basic definitions that you want to go through about colic. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. I enjoy working with you as well. And quite honestly, this is my favorite topic to talk about. It's why I specialized after my surgery residency in ECC. And partly that's because colic is such a scary thing for us horse owners out there. Uh, To to start with definitions, I'm sure that the, uh, the Equus readership knows what what colic is and knows several types that run the gamut from just a mild gas colic all the way to something that requires surgery. But just as a reminder and and to let you know what I'm talking about when I say colic, colic is a horse that exhibits any kind of abdominal pain. And uh, the signs can be from mild to very severe. And most of the time, because of the way the horse GI tract is structured, we're talking about when a horse colics, it's probably something wrong with the gastrointestinal tract. But once we as veterinarians rule that out, we've got to consider also things that might also show as discomfort, like the equine reproductive tract, whether it's a stallion or a mare, uh, the urinary tract, or potentially even something going on in the thoracic cavity that might show signs that that are consistent with, with certain types of colic, like standing with the elbows abducted out from the body, uh, breathing quickly, um, and and inappetence. So there are definitely overlapping Venn diagrams when we talk about ways horse, horses show discomfort. Yeah, and when you talk about the Venn diagrams, let's explain what that is. Yeah, so I, I think when I look at a case, I try to stratify what that horse looks like based on the signs that they're giving me. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about the nitty gritty of the physical exam, but when I stand back and hear that a horse is colicking or the owner is concerned about colic, I look at what that horse is doing. And it can run from the spectrum of mild, maybe standing there with their head down. We talk about airplane ears. Um, there's a, a recent study that talks about how Facial expressions in horses are easier to read than even in dogs. And we all know that, right? We know when our horse isn't feeling well. Um, So that's probably the mild side, more moderate, maybe flank watching, increased respiratory effort. We'll talk about a couple of ways to measure heart rate because that's quite important in, in stratifying pain. All the way to the more severe signs of laying down, rolling, or even becoming so uncomfortable, they're endangering themselves, animals around them, and the people around them as well. So there's there's just, a, I think, I joke with, with my students in the clinic, horses kind of have only a few ways to show their their discomfort, and, and a lot of it looks like colic. Yeah, and that's, that's really helpful because so many times we either ignore subtle signs or we think everything is colic and it's the gut. So I, I appreciate you going through that. Let's let's maybe talk about, I know some of the research has looked at breed and age and some things like that with colic. So what can you help us with about those? Yeah, and and again, as a, a, a clinician, I kind of try to stratify things, um, go through what we call on on the veterinary side, our problem list. And then we try to make a diagnosis fit a problem list. So um, 
certain problems may manifest in the horse's signalment or breed and age or their history. So very um, famously, there's a couple of breeds that are predisposed to enteroliths or concretions that form in the colon of, of horses. Um, Arabs are one of them, Arabian horses, and then miniature horses are another. So that's something to consider anytime you're looking at an Arab or a miniature. Um, other parts of the history and another thing that pre predisposes horses to enterolith formation um, is, is a diet high in alfalfa just because of the calcium and phosphorus ratios in that hay. Now, enterolis aren't a very common cause of colic in most areas of the country aside from Arizona, California, but they're ones that definitely fit the, the there's a breed stereotype and there's a diet stereotype. Another stereotype that's really common in especially the Kentucky, Florida, uh, Ohio region, anywhere that there's a lot of brood mares is brood mares usually in the first couple weeks after foaling are at higher risk of large colonic displacements or even more scary, large colon volvuli. So a lot of the excellent caretakers in our thoroughbred population know that as soon as that mare shows any signs of colic, but particularly severe signs of colic, to get her to a referral center as soon as possible. Yeah, and those are really important. And we have listeners from all over the country. Um, let's maybe talk a little bit about the, the different types of colic and maybe some of the signs that you would see with them. Sure. And, and Kim, the, the colics that I've mentioned are some of the most serious ones. Enterolis, large colon volvuli require surgery, but most colics don't. So when we're talking most common causes of colic, we're usually talking either gas colic or displacements of the colon. And those will show with signs that are on the less severe side. So uh, depending on how stoic your horse is, um, uh, which is another way to, to ask, is he wimpy or not? Um, a horse may exhibit the flame in response, stretching out, looking like he wants to urinate or she wants to urinate and not, or even to the point where they're flank watching, pawing, or laying down but not necessarily rolling. I'd put all of those signs in the mild to moderate categories of, of signs of colic. We talked a little bit about, you know, there, there are different types of colic. And we, you talked a little bit about, you know, enterolis, if you're feeding in an area where you feed a lot of alfalfa, which mm -hmm. in one thing, we feed a lot of alfalfa because that's what they grow there. In Kentucky, you worried about some other things when I lived in Kentucky. Um, so let's maybe talk a little bit about management of horses and how that might affect colic. I know you said that you get a lot of questions from horse owners of, oh, my gosh, could I have done something to prevent this? And in some cases, the answer is yes. And in some cases, it's no. Sure, sure. And and I think a lot of those things we all learned in Pony Club 4-H still hold to be true. Um, so slow transitions to any new feedstuffs, uh, either from new batch of hay with a different percentage of, of um, alfalfa versus types of grass, and certainly a slow transition to different types of grain. We talked all about overlapping Venn diagrams of colic signs. Well, there's overlapping Venn diagrams of different diseases that horses are prone to as well. And let me explain a little bit more of, of what I'm talking about. So a, a horse that's getting a high amount of grain with a lot of sugar in it, what we call non-structural carbohydrates, may be more prone to colic, but they're also prone to a lot of other issues that we we see in horses, particularly metabolic disease. So high grain diets for me are reserved only for those horses that are in a lot of athletic work. So the race horses, um, feral horses, um, things like that. Other horses should probably get a lower starch diet with a lot of roughage, both for gut health and then also metabolic health as well. So we've all heard that the weather causes colic. So does the weather really cause colic? I guess the there's not a whole lot of literature to necessarily suggest that, but we certainly see types of colic more frequently um, with, with times where the weather changes. And I'm not sure if that's weather dependent or just that the equine GI is so sensitive to change 
And when there's massive fluctuations in weather and bar or barometric pressure, there's also changes in, like you mentioned, management, where I know in Ohio, it's 19 degrees today. The ground is icy. None of the horses in any of the barns are getting their normal turnout today. And that may be enough to, to incite um, certain types of colic. I think the horse as, a, as an individual is just really prone to, to any kind of change. They like routine. They like being fed at the same time. They like being fed the same thing. They like the same amount of turnout, same amount of exercise every day. And if they don't get that, one of the ways that they may manifest their displeasure is colic. Okay. And is there anything besides some of the, the you know, ch make changes slowly in the diet and make sure that you're, you know, trying to keep them on as, as much of a routine as possible. Is there anything else that owners can do to help prevent colic? Yeah, there's, there's a couple other things that we really try to target. Um, when we hear of a horse that has, especially those horses that have more than one of an episode of colic. So maybe they pulled through medically, but they just seem to colic once every couple of months. The first thing is dentition. So routine dental care, um, uh, at least getting the teeth checked once a year so we can ensure those horses are chewing up their roughage acceptably, that they don't have long stems of hay or grass that's, that's hard to break down. The other thing that we're targeting is a deworming regimen. Um, there are certainly some types of parasites that can cause uh, chronic colic or weight loss. And the deworming protocols have significantly changed over the last couple of decades with the emergence of resistance of some of these parasiticidals to, to the worms and horses. So check with your veterinarian about what they would recommend as far as fecal egg counts and deworming. And if you want more information than that, um, the equine practitioners site uh, has a really good um, breakdown of, of deworming recommendations for horses that's available to veterinarians or owners. And then the third thing, and maybe because Kim's from Wyoming and I've lived in Ohio and Colorado is, is we see a lot of impactions when water buckets freeze. And, and that is just something I think I learned day one of 4-H, um, again, maybe growing up in Colorado, but horses have to have access to clean, fresh water um, or there's a, a risk of, of colic, particularly impaction development. Yeah, I actually was visiting Kentucky and was driving down one of the back roads and saw uh, someone's pony out pawing at the ice in the water mm -hmm. tank because, you know, they, they were trying to get him a drink. And that's, you know, that's something we have to be careful of. And make sure and check our waters because some of them freeze up, especially if you're having lower than usual temperatures. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember one of my chores growing up on a ranch was breaking the ice and <laughs> it's not fun, but it's necessary. I got to say the favorite thing that ever was invented was the heated water, oh, heated yeah. pneumatic waters. Oh, I love them. <laughs> not fun. having to carry buckets of water and, and trying to keep the tanks from freezing. Whew, those are great. Keep your horse happy and healthy and get rewarded with free products at the same time. Farnham Horse Health Products and Vitaflex Pro are proud to celebrate the partnership between you and your horse. So they created the Horse Care Loyalty Rewards Program. It's their way of giving back and provides an opportunity for you to earn complimentary, full-size supplements, fly control, and grooming products that you use regularly. Receive one free product for every five purchased at any online or local retail store. View a complete list of eligible products at horsecareloyalty.com. Enroll today and start earning your rewards. And I understand that uh, you just recently acquired a new horse. I did, and now I realize why horse owners worry so much. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're real pleased to, to let everybody know that Dr. Gardner has adopted an off-the-track thoroughbred, and uh, she is in the process of working with her trainer, and uh, we, we look forward maybe in a future podcast of getting a little update. This is a very recent purchase, so she's still in the I love my pony stage. 
It's true. It's true. <laughs> well, you better believe as soon as I acquired him, I started the paperwork to get him insured because he's a horse. They get sick and he's a veterinarian's horse now. So. <laughs> Which means they'll get sick more. That's just right. kind of like the best horse in the field always gets hurt. It's the veterinarian's horse that always needs something to, done to them. So, well, back to colic a little bit. Is there anything else that you would like to, if you were in a barn talking to some horse owners, that you would like to say to them about equine colic? Yeah, I um, I think we've talked about management changes, some of the more common causes of colic being gas colic displacement. Um, I think when I talk to owners about colic, um, I think the, the main thing is to have a plan because um, if you've owned a horse for long enough, I've, I've had my personal horses colic. Um, I, I think most of the horse owners I know that have had horses for decades have at least had one colic episode um, in their, their horses. Um, and that's, so the first thing I say is just have a plan, um, have a good relationship with your veterinarian, know what to do in an emergency. Um, and and uh, as with any disaster, whether it's with an individual animal getting sick or in case of a natural disaster, um, if if your horse would ever have a referral option, find a figure out a way to, to get them off the property in a non-emergent situation. The other thing that that is often helpful for a veterinarian going out to see a horse, the most important kind of uh, physical exam finding other than those signs of colic that we're, we talked about is how high that heart rate is. So an, a normal adult horse, thousand pound horse, has a heart rate somewhere between 30 and 48. Um, a more stoic horse will have a lower heart rate and you know some of those those yearlings, two year olds may have an, a slightly higher heart rate. But if it's higher than that, then then there is some discomfort anxiety. Um, so usually I, I again, you're probably getting the impression that I like to put things into boxes so I stratify a heart rate into how serious I think it is. So if it's in a calm, say, teenage warm blood that's been around, if if the heart rate's 44 to 60, then then I'd say that's mild to moderately elevated. If it's 60 to 80, that's that's markedly elevated. I would expect that horse is, is in a significant amount of pain, either showing that or being stoic about it. If it's above 80, then there's something more than pain going on. The the um, vascular system is made to increase heart rate when an animal is significantly stressed, sick, or dehydrated. So if it's above 80, then I'm, I'm worried that animal is, is not just painful, but also very sick as well. Um, so you can get a stethoscope. They're not cheap, the ones I use, but there's some, some ones where you can just hear heart rate that are, that are probably about 20 to 30 bucks or you can also just put your finger underneath the, the curve of the jaw, the mandible, to feel the arterial pulse there or behind the left elbow. And usually you can get a, a good feeling of the pulse there. Given, of course, if that horse is safe and standing still, I, I don't recommend that if the horse is laying down to roll. And then the last thing I usually tell horse owners and, and anybody that knows me, has accused me of being a Pollyanna before, but there are just some some types of colic that an owner has really no control over. Um, we're seeing a lot of owners that, I guess their control over the horse is that they're having such good management that these horses are surviving well into their 20s and and horses above 20 are pretty prone in far as insofar as colic to a, a disease called a strangulating lipoma. And that's just same kind of fatty benign tumors that grow on the side of old Labrador retrievers, unfortunately grow in horse abdomens and they can wrap themselves around GI viscera like the small intestines. I've had a lot of horse owners ask me what they could do um, to prevent those because those do require surgery. And and the answer is you took too good a care of your horse, then they lived into their 20s. And, and age is not, not a disease. We operate on a lot of, of horses in their 20s, and they do just fine afterwards. But, but that's something I would consider a, a risk factor as so a horse ages as well. And just one of those examples of something that, 
an owner cannot control. Yeah, and that's that's a good tip is is yeah. some things you just can't prevent. But as as horse owners, I mean some of the things you and I had talked about earlier, I I have been really bad about switching over from my grass hay to my alfalfa hay when something is short and you have to change over and you know, getting it in and just forgetting to mix it or something. And, you know, that that's management. That's something I need to do better. It is. And and most of the time we get get away with that. And and don't by no means am I disparaging alfalfa with this. It's an excellent yeah. feed stuff, but um but uh it's it's just one of those examples. But I I agree and, and I think I have to remind myself a lot um that that horses like routine. Well, those are our great tips today. And we really appreciate it, Dr. Gardner, that you joined us today. And we thank our audience for joining us on Equus Farm Calls. And we're excited to launch this podcast in 2022. And we welcome your input and hope you'll tell your friends about it. If you have any suggestions for the podcast, send me an email to kbrown, that's the letter K Brown, at equinenetwork.com. Equus Farm Calls is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC. 